3. The column of single figures is given in order to complete the table. In some of the later occult schools, the characters and numbers in it serve to conceal the meaning of the column of planetary influences. For my own part, I have not changed the traditional form as I do not ascribe much value to this attitude. Actually, the figure 3 is somewhat similar to the sign for Saturn and that of a serpent, which is dedicated to that planet. 4 is very close to the symbol for Jupiter. 5 may look like a very badly drawn sign for Mars. And 6 may remind us of the vortexes, turbulons, and vibrations of all kinds with which the sun blesses us so generously. To Venus are dedicated all regular shaped figures. For who is more worthy of such a tribute to outer things of harmony and beauty? The figure 8 might suggest the caduceus of Mercury, and 9, that of two unequally drawn crescents of the moon. 4. The Colors of the Planets These have not only a conditional meaning in rituals for planetary ceremonial magic, but may still serve for the distinguishing of manifestations connected with one or another planet. Speaking in terms of the auras, that is, the subtle emanations of partially materialized planetary entities, we will find that these contain the shades of the planetary colors, which thereby underline the background of these visions. 5. The Column of Aromas This gives the prescriptions used for related planetary magic operations. Incense is synthetic to such a degree that it can easily substitute every other kind of aroma, but it should be noted that when using incense, the moods of the operator become more mystical. This is why incense does not figure in any planetary operation of black magic. When aromas have to be used in magic operations, the substances are burned directly or allowed to smolder on hot charcoal. Aromas of vegetable origin can be used as extracts made with alcohol, or dried parts of plants. The second variation is much more desirable and effective. 6. Planetary Metals These are mentioned only for use in some ceremonial operations, as well as for making planetary talismans and pentacles. The difference between talismans and pentacles is subtle, for both can be worn on one's body. A talisman is made for the purpose of condensing energy already existing in the individual. Because of this, it would be nonsensical for a person almost devoid of Jupiter's influence to wear that planet's talisman. In contrast to talismans, pentacles, as a result of their preparation and consecration, are magnetized with the fluids of definite planets, and thereby can artificially create a tie with the egregoric elements of those planets. The person previously mentioned might wear a pentacle consecrated to Jupiter just because he feels the need to have the influence of that planet, with which he does not possess any natural liaison. Now it is time to tell you about the method of creating a pentagram used in magic operations. The general character of the pentagram relates to its synthetic properties. Therefore, on the physical plane it should be made of an alloy containing the seven planetary metals. On the astral plane, the ceremony of its consecration must put us into contact with all seven planetary influences. The pentagram is consecrated by six minor and one major magic ceremonies. The great ceremony must be performed under the influence of the planet which dominates the astral of the future bearer of the pentagram. The remaining six minor operations belong to the six other planets. The synthesis of the pentagram's elements suggests to us not only the thought about its necessity for summarizing the planetary influences, but also our recognition of the polarity of human nature and contemplation, which are neutralized in the person of a true occultist magician. A slight reminder for the student. He must always clearly grasp the terms used in every sentence of this course. Otherwise, for him, it becomes merely a confused exposition of an unknown subject. So, when speaking here of the polarity of a human being, we mean that there are two opposite poles in consciousness, and consequently in all our bodies. We are able to do both good and evil. 
we are apt to seek after the noisy life of great cities with their empty entertainments and sins. But we are also able to remain in the peace of inner silence, independent of all our surrounding. In us, and nowhere else but in us, there is potentially a saint and a devil like black occultist. In us are the sublime intelligence and practical, unselfish ideas of Thomas A. Kempis and Albert Schweitzer. But we also produce reckless egoism and contempt for man's legitimate rights, and the cruelty of the Stalins and the Hitlers. Advanced occultists and spiritual masters know this fact very well, and from it comes their equality towards all men, the thing which an average man cannot and should not attempt to try before he is ripe simply because an indiscriminate, even though well-intentioned action, brings only harm and often catastrophe. I cannot but quote here a well-known tale about the hermit and his bear. A saintly man who lived in a desert domesticated a large bear, which served the old man by bringing him wild honey and frightening away annoying flies, which tried to settle on the hermit's bald head. One day, noticing an especially cheeky fly, which was unafraid of the branch which the hermit had given to his bear to wave over him, the animal decided to destroy the small offender. The bear took a heavy stone, watched carefully until the fly came to rest on the hermit's pat, and then hit it hard, thereby destroying the insect, and at the same time the brains of his master. The variations on this old tale, although indifferent and not such drastic outer forms, are committed too often by human beings to be ignored.